Hello, welcome back. Welcome back to the second part of this tutorial on quantitative coding and complexity theory of continuous data. So let me fire up the slides and we will start with a brief recap of the first part. So in the first part, we talked about computing on so-called basic spaces that is on counter space and on this kind of bare space, which is maybe it's a misnomer, it's just counter space, but with the elements, <clears throat> the indices of the sequence now indexed by finite binary strings rather than by natural numbers. Uh, these spaces are all compact and compactness that we saw is essential because total computation on compact domains allows for a single natural number cost parameter, which is uh, kind of non-trivial because in general, uh, each of these spaces <coughs> is uncountable. So even if a computation takes a finite time on every possible uh, of these uncountably many inputs, uh, then this by no means <laughs> obvious that <clears throat> the, there's a overall bound, a worst case bound on the computation time uh, because that worst case naively would be taking uh, the maximum over these <clears throat> uncountably many finite times, which may in general be infinite. But since uh, computation is continuous, uh, in particular the number of steps made before termination <coughs> is uh, continuous and a continuous function on a compact domain does attain its maximum. So that here we can measure, uh, count the number of steps it takes until let's say the nth bit has been output uh, independent of <coughs> the uh, argument of the uncountably many possible arguments. So compactness is important. It's a first lesson to take away <coughs> for the computing on basic spaces. The second lesson is <coughs> that computational cost. So if uh, some computation, some function can be computed in time t of n, then this basically gives rise to models of continuity of that function, <coughs> which means that if a function has large modulus of continuity, then it necessarily requires large computational cost. And put differently, <clears throat> if the computation of a, a function with large modulus of continuity takes a lot of time, then that's not the fault of the algorithm. It's kind of inherent, intrinsic to the function under consideration. <clears throat> so we kind of want to <clears throat> take away the blame for such cases and one way of uh, still considering computation of such uh, <coughs> uh, function with highly large modulus of continuity efficient, <coughs> one way is to consider relative polynomial time bounds, that is <coughs> time, runtime bounds that are polynomial in the parameter n, which usually measures uh, the time until the nth output bit appears, plus the models of continuity. So that functions that have a large models of continuity automatically get uh, allotted more computation time and still are considered polynomial time. And there's a subtle point here, namely, we also allow for polynomial <coughs> uh, transformation on the argument to this modulus of continuity. This is kind of a restricted version of uh, second order polynomials considered, for instance, by uh, Mehlhorn or by uh, Capron and Cook or by Kawamura and Cook. And uh, <clears throat> the difference here is now that we prohibit iteration of this second order parameter mu. This is something that, for instance, Florian Steinberg had considered. <clears throat> but anyway, that's uh, for the experts side explanation. So this is about computing on these basic spaces and our goal is to <clears throat> extend these properties 
uh, uh, to other spaces, spaces equipped with so-called representations, that's a uh, Bayer type two theory, and uh, computing functions between the represented spaces is defined in terms of realizers, that is in terms of transformations, um, <clears throat> transformations that uh, translate names to names. Um, and uh, we want <clears throat> to have representations that make these three properties carry over from the basic spaces to the represented spaces. And an important criterion for such a, a representation uh, is the admissibility, or let's say qualitative admissibility, according to Kreitz and Weirauch, 1985, uh, <clears throat> which uh, uh, is a condition for a representation to make sure that uh, <clears throat> every computable function or every function, continuous function, has a continuous realizer and vice versa. So that's kind of the qualitative version, uh, the so-called mind, uh, mind theorem of Kreitz and Weirauch. And of course, one important property of this condition is that a sufficiently large class of spaces actually has an admissible representation, namely all T0 spaces, that's Kreitz and Weirauch's result, and actually even more, all QCB spaces, that's Matthias Schröder's uh, result. And of course, we're, we're looking for a notion of, a uh, quantitative notion of admissibility that yields a quantitative version of the main theorem. And of course, we want that notion to make sure also that a sufficiently rich class of spaces actually admits a representation that satisfies this quantitative property. And for the real case, we have a pretty good picture. The binary naive representation is not admissible, which corresponds to failure of the main theorem. Um, for instance, uh, addition is continuous, but it does not have a continuous realizer. It's this rational representation is admissible, but uh, here the main theorem does not strengthen to a, a quantitative version. Um, the rational representation in the technical level is not uniformly continuous. It has no modulus of continuity. So we cannot expect for this property to carry over from basic spaces to spaces, the sphere real numbers when equipped with a rational representation. Real numbers when equipped with the dyadic representation, there's this <clears throat> kind of Taylor theorem of Carrico, uh, which can be found in his book, Between the Lines in the Proof of a Theorem, <clears throat> maybe that uh, where the dyadic representation <clears throat> uh, has the property that a function with polynomial modulus of continuity has a realizer with polynomial modulus of continuity and vice versa. And we want <clears throat> to find a definition uh, of polynomial admissibility we don't have a definition here at this moment, but we will have in this second part uh, of polynomial admissibility that, uh, that uh, generalizes to other spaces. And the sign digit representation has even better property. Namely, <coughs> here function with linear modulus of continuity has a realizer with linear modulus of continuity and vice versa. So we're looking for a notion of linear admissibility that is satisfied by sign digit representation and that generalizes to other spaces in their representation. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for definitions, basically. So that's a uh, recap of part one. And now we move on to part two. Uh, we have just co completed the recap of our uh, part. And in part two, <clears throat> we're going to kind of fill this dictionary. This is a dictionary. Uh, of uh, translating between qualitative and quantitative notions. So on the left side of this uh, table, you see qualitative notions like computability. On the right hand side, there are quantitative notions like complexity, qualitative topology, quantitative metric properties. We will uh, recall them. For instance, quantitative topological notion is continuity. Uh, quantitative metric corresponding notion is 
having a modulus of continuity. Qualitative notion of topology is compactness. Quantitative counterpart is entropy, according to Kolmogorov, and we will introduce that uh, in the next slide. Uh, qualitative properties that every continuous image of a compact set is compact again, and a quantitative counterpart to that is a lemma that was discovered and proved by Florian Steinberg in his PhD thesis. So, and uh, after they having filled this dictionary in the next few slides, then we're going to uh, finally be able to uh, conceive a definition for polynomial admissibility, which is going to turn out to be rather subtle. Um, it uh, involves the notion of polynomial reduction, maybe it's also called relative polynomial reduction, because it's uh, again, like with relative polynomial time here, it depends on n and it depends on the second order parameter, which turns out to be the entropy. It uh, will give rise to a notion of polynomial admissibility, which in turn gives rise to a polynomial version, a quantitative version of the main theorem that uh, achieves what we just said, a relating a uh, function with polynomial models of continuity to realizers with polynomial models of continuity, but it is only a tentative version. It has some disadvantages, some deficiencies that we will discuss uh, at the end of this part two. So that being said, let's start uh, by filling this dictionary. And we want to talk about compactness and continuity qualitatively and quantitatively. Because the definition of admissibility, qualitative to the Kaiser and Weirauch, that is all based on qualitative notions. For instance, continuity here, continuity here, and here continuous reduction. What does continuous reduction here mean? I will remind that uh, of, of in the next slide. Uh, but first, let's recall the properties of computing on basic spaces and we want to carry over to represented spaces. First, that uh, every total computation on a compact domain admits a single parameter time bound depending on a natural number parameter. And this in turn gives rise to a modulus of continuity after some constant shift. And uh, to remind you also, uh, <coughs> computing or represented spaces, computing a function f, between represented spaces x and y, a group of representations xi and epsilon uh, means to compute a realizer transformation that translates names of arguments of to f to names of values of f of x. And we know what it means to compute such a realizer because these are basic spaces and thus we can define computation on represented spaces where this commutativity diagram is now can be expressed using this <coughs> uh, algebraic property that these two compositions uh, <coughs> have the re relation that the left one is a restriction of the right hand side. And this expresses <coughs> that we don't require a realizer to be undefined uh, or to return any warning when it is presented with an argument that lies outside of the domain of the function we are considering. <clears throat> so this is a, an important observation of the uh, Weyerhaus theory. If we want here this to be really equivalent, this is called strong comput computation. And this doesn't have the nice property already in the <clears throat> qualitative computability as uh, Klaus Weyerhaus has observed. And therefore we consider this uh, weaker condition of being a, a restriction or being on the right hand side an extension kind of. Okay, so now we want these two properties of, uh, to carry over from basic spaces to represented spaces, namely that every computation on a compact domain has a single natural number parameter time bound and that every computable function that is computed in a certain time has a modulus that is described in terms of this time bound because then we can use that to define relative polynomial time computation, relative 
to the output precision and relative to a modulus of continuity. And <clears throat> so we want to oppose a quantitative condition, a quantitative strengthening of admissibility on the representation under consideration. And the natural way is to uh, strengthen this qualitative continuity to quantitative continuity, namely using a modulus of continuity. So uh, modulus of continuity should be small. So let's just define as a first attempt representation to be polynomial admissibility. If first property has a compact domain, and secondly, it has a polynomial modulus of continuity. Why does it seem like a good idea for a definition? Because have a compact domain, make sure that <coughs> the, the domain of the uh, realizer we are looking at is again compact, right? So if X is compact, then the pre-image of F is a, uh, uh, is going to be the domain of the representation. Now, hypothesis that this domain must be compact. That's exactly what uh, makes the first property carry over from basic spaces to represented spaces, namely that it has such a time bound, having a compact domain. This has been observed, of course, long ago by Klaus Weirauch and by Matthias Schröder. So this is a well-known uh, important property of uh, representations to admit a complexity theory. The second property we want small modulus is because we know by the course theorem that <coughs> function with large modulus may have a long running time. So in order for to express efficiency, we were at least interested in representation with small models of continuity, let's say polynomial, because we're trying here to define polynomial admissibility. However, unfortunately, the second condition turns out to be unreasonable and suitable uh, for, and I'm going to explain on the next slide why this is not a good definition and I'm going to uh, introduce a revised definition. So why is, uh, can, we, cannot, can we not expect a representation to have a polynomial modulus? Uh, that's the reason is uh, because of this entropy. Entropy as introduced by Kolmogorov in 1939 is a quantitative strengthening of total boundedness. Uh, basically, it's a, it's a modulus of total boundedness. It's a scholarization of the qualitative property of total boundedness, just like a modulus of continuity is a scholarization of qualitative uniform continuity. And the definition is the following. Uh, by total boundedness, compact space can be covered by finitely many balls of, let's say, closed balls of radius two to the minus n. And the entropy basically counts how many such balls are sufficient to do that, the least number, so uh, <clears throat> uh, the optimal number. And the actually small as aspect here, we only count in integer powers of two, similar to modulus of continuity, which also considers integer powers of two. So that's Kolmogorov's definition. Basically, it has been well known in uh, <coughs> com computability and complexity theory, continuous data, for instance, Klaus Weirauch, 2003. And just to give you an impression of <coughs> what this notion is, for some popular spaces, for instance, the real unit interval has linear entropy, more precisely the d-dimensional unit cube has entropy d times n. And if we scale the unit cube with two to the k, then this mm, corresponds to a shift in the argument of the entropy. So mm, basically all Euclidean subsets have linear entropy. <coughs> Cantor space also has linear entropy, but uh, as you recall, this hierarchy of higher and higher uh, basic spaces. Uh, this is really a hierarchy as expressed and reflected by the entropy, namely for instance, this kind of bare space here has exponential entropy. This hyperspace that we considered has double exponential entropy. And as you can imagine, one can continue playing that game and climb up further and further 
on a, a hierarchy of towers, exponential towers. More generally, if we have a <coughs> compact metric space X with certain entropy eta, then considering the space of one Lipschitz functions, non-expensive functions from X to the counter space, this is something as you may recall, we denote by X dagger. This is again a compact metric space according to Arzela Ascoli. And the entropy of this space when equipped with the supremal norm is exponential in the original entropy. It's two to the a polynomial plus the entropy shifted with the linear factor. Observe again that we have here something uh, kind of relative polynomial, right? Polynomial in N plus a second order parameter, namely the entropy of the original space linear with a linear shift. <clears throat> and the same also actually holds for the uh, space X prime, the space of one Lipschitz function from X to the real unit interval. So if you consider here as codomain the counter space or the real unit interval has little effect on the entropy. As we iterate this here, we get a hierarchy of higher and higher order spaces. If we iterate this, we get a high or hierarchy of higher and higher order spaces. And this gives rise to a hierarchy of <coughs> powers, uh, towers of two, powers of two, including and recovering these two spaces. So this gives you an impression of the meaning of entropy. And now we can state Florian Steinberg's lemma, quantitative counterpart to the fact that uh, the image, the continuous image of a compact set is compact again. If we have a, a function from x to, from y to z, that has modulus mu, and if the domain has entropy eta, then the range, which we know is compact, but quantitatively it has entropy at most, the composition of eta with mu, the composition of the, do, of the entropy of the domain, with the modulus of continuity mu. And why is this important relative to us? Because this really shows that we cannot impose the second condition here in our definition of uh, polynomial admissibility. This uh, in general, these spaces don't have such a representation. Uh, we're talking about the uh, kind of an empty set possibly, namely when we have uh, consider representations from counter space, which has linear entropy to the space of linear real functions uh, of one Lipschitz functions from the unit interval to the unit interval, which has exponential entropy. Then according to Steinberg's lemma, um, so here the ground space has linear entropy, the range has exponential entropy, thus requiring the representation to have an exponential modulus of continuity and no, no better. So we cannot hope for such a representation of a polynomial modulus of continuity. This is not a good definition because it, uh, even such simple spaces don't have a uh, polynomially admissible representation in this sense. Now there are two ways, possible ways to avoid that. One way is the approach taken by Akitoshi Kawamura in his PhD thesis, namely he replaced the uh, domain of the representation, counter space with its linear entropy, by a uh, other uh, basic space with exponential entropy, namely basically this one. I'm lying here to be technically correct, but uh, for all practical purposes, let's just say uh, bare space here, because bare space also has exponential entropy, the codomain has the exponential entropy. So according to Florence lemma, now it is possible, and actually it is, to have a representation with polynomial models of continuity. And Akitoshi Kawamura constructs such a representation and calls it data blank. And uh, it has a polynomial models of continuity. That's one way of avoiding the obstacle of Steinberg's lemma maybe replacing the domain of the representation with some uh, basic space of higher entropy, exponentially larger entropy. Another way, which we're going to pursue here for a moment, actually later we're going to combine both ways, but for now, 
or approach here is instead of imposing a polynomial modulus of continuity, we impose a relative polynomial bound on the modulus that is uh, <clears throat> modulus that is polynomial in n plus the entropy of the space and the cons consideration. So basically, we're doing the same thing as we did for the <clears throat> when we defined relative polynomial uh, time for functions with high modulus of continuity. So this is our first and uh, no, already our second draft definition for the representation polynomial admissible if it has a compact domain as before and has a modulus of continuity which is polynomial in the entropy. Uh, actually, uh, we're going to do the same thing as we did with functions, namely we're considering polynomial in n plus the entropy and we're going to consider polynomial transformation on the argument to the entropy. This uh, will have nicer, closer properties. So that's uh, our first uh, part of the definition, uh, tentative definition of polynomial admissibility. These two properties, strengthening uh, uh, qualitative property of admissibility to Kreitz and Barrow. Okay, now let's move on to the second condition of Kreitz and Barrow, namely that every continuous representation has a continuous reduction to this current representation, where continuous reduction means there exists a continuous transformation on names such that the new representation zeta is a restriction of this uh, composition here. Um, and we want to make that qualitative notion, uh, quali uh, quantitative notion, uh, qualitative notion, quantitative. So here's a, a natural way of doing that. Just replace all qualitative notions with quantitative notions captured by modulus of continuity. So <clears throat> we're going to define polynomial reduction, not polynomial time, but polynomial reduction between representations <clears throat> in the following way. So <clears throat> if we have representations zeta and xi, and both have moduli of continuity, nu and mu, these moduli of continuity, then <clears throat> reduct polynomial reduction from zeta to xi means that there exists a continuous transformation of names that has this same condition, but now this transformation is supposed to have a modulus of continuity. So we're capturing, we're strengthening continuity of the translation quantitatively in this modulus of continuity. And we're going to impose a condition, this modulus of continuity kappa should be small in a certain sense. Um, how small can we make this? We already ran into a trap when we hear we prior to polynomial models of continuity naively. We had to revise that. And similarly, let's see how small of models of continuity kappa, uh, what's the least possible models of continuity we can expect. Well, according to these two, uh, uh, these two entities, recall that so zeta is equipped with the models of continuity nu Xi is equipped with modulus of continuity mu. F has modulus of continuity kappa, which we still don't know yet. But recall that the composition of two such uniformly continuous functions with given modulus of continuity uh, is the composition of the moduli of continuity flipped. Uh, and since this is a restriction, that means that the optimal of these modulus of continuity of zeta is lesser equal to the composition of the modulus of continuity of f and the modulus of continuity of c uh, swapped, swapped. So <clears throat> this is automatically the, the case. So if we want to impose a condition on kappa, we better make sure that the condition satisfies this inequality. Otherwise, uh, there will not be any polynomial admissible representations at all. And so what we're going to impose is that kappa should come as close as possible to satisfy this inequality. Namely, we want require that the uh, reverse inequality also holds. So that's kind of an optimality condition on the models of continuity kappa. 
Um, that seems uh, reasonable naively, but it turns out that in general, we cannot impose that in general. Then we run into this trouble that uh, spaces may not have uh, polynomial admissible representation that satisfy this strong uh, inequality that make this here a equality, right? This is what follows this and this together means there's equality, but we cannot hope for that in general. Instead, what we're going to do, we're going to modify that hypothesis, that con condition, and allow for a little bit of slack. What do I mean with slack? Um, uh, we are going to allow the same as we did, similar as we did here before, relative polynomial, relative, mean depending on n, it's new, and depending on uh, new, and we're going to allow for additional slack here, polynomial in n in the argument. That's basically the same here. Know that only that here the entropy is replaced by this modulus of continuity new. That's going to be our condition. So that basically means this inequality is almost attained up to this polynomial slack. Now, again, as uh, reasonable as this seems, Finally, I have to convince you that it seems reasonable. I'm going to change your mind again, Amy. This definition is not, uh, does not give yield transitivity. So polynomial reduction in this sense, uh, in this definition is not transitive. But of course we want reductions to be transitive. So we're not going to take that definition either. What we're going to take, and I promise this is not the final, and the ultimate definition uh, for polynomial reduction is this one. We're going to allow for a slack here in the argument, but not polynomial slack in the value. Okay, let me say it again. Polynomial uh, slack in the argument, but not in the value. And this definition is the one we're going to, uh, that's going to stick. This notion uh, makes sure that polynomial reduction is closed under composition. It also makes sure that every compact metric space has a polynomial admissible representation in this sense that satisfies these two properties. So this is kind of a, a very fine line that we're uh, walking here. We found a, a, a weak a soft spot between these two definitions. This one is the one we're picking. And it took quite some effort to arrive at that, as you can imagine. Okay, so now this is the definition. And now we can uh, really state a polynomial quantitative version of the qualitative kreitz weyoch main theorem, where admissibility, quantitative admissibility, is replaced by quantitative polynomial admissibility. Uh, this uh, our polynomial version of the main theorem uh, has four items. And the first item, uh, right, so this was uh, proven, actually different items are proven in different uh, uh, papers and uh, they're not uh, stated in the way that I'm going to present it here, but the proofs uh, actually are in the papers that exhibit the following claims. First, every compact metric space actually has a polynomially admissible representation. Remember that we took us pretty much effort uh, when designing the, the uh, definition to make sure that it satisfies this property uh, the same way that Matthias Schröder proved that every QCP space admits a qualitatively admissible representation. Second uh, item in the uh, polynomial main theorem says that this uh, notion of polynomial reduction between uh, representations is transitive. And again, recall that this took us particular effort uh, to, in the definition to arrive at the definition. Uh, then, and there was a trade off between both. Unfortunately, between both extremes, there was a soft spot that uh, in the definition that satisfies now both. So we have these two items. And finally, the uh, item C and D, these are kind of the quantitative version of the uh, original main theorem, namely uh, main theorem relates continuity of a function 
having continuous realizer and items C and D relate quantitative continuity of a function expressed in a certain models of continuity to quantitative continuity of a realizer expressed by a, a slightly different models of continuity. So we don't have and we cannot expect a really uh, identical, we cannot expect both to have the same models of continuity, the function and its realizer. So there's going to be a little slack uh, when proceeding back and forth from function to realize and back. But let me first state the first half of this quantitative main theorem, namely if we have polynomial admissible representation Xi and Upsilon for compact metric spaces X and Y, they exist according to item A. And let's denote their least modular continuity by mu and nu. Now if F the function has a modulus kappa, then it has a realizer whose modulus, which we call lambda, is bounded from above by the modulus of continuity of a, a representation, modulus of continuity of the original function, polynomial slack, and uh, modulus of continuity of the second representation inverse. Uh, now here's a subtle point that I need to explain more detail. This is, this is a inverse of a function from natural numbers to natural numbers and such functions usually do not have uh, inverses. So what we, this is supposed to mean, it's a kind of sign of a pseudo inverse, maybe maybe n to the least m such that nu of m is greater or equal to n. It uh, uh, doesn't satisfy all the properties from an inverse but it's pretty uh, sufficiently close to an inverse. And this is not the models of continuity of the inverse representation. That doesn't make sense because the representation epsilon it doesn't have an inverse. It's not injective, as you recall. So here we have the first relation between models of continuity of a function and a bound on the models of continuity of a realizer, quantitative continuity, claim that depends, of course, on the modulus of continuity of the function, but also involves modulus of continuity of a representation and inverse modulus of continuity of the other representation and some polynomial slack. It's the first statement, function, continuous function, quantitatively continuous function gives rise to quantitatively continuous realizer. And the last item D is a converse if a function uh, has a realizer with modulus of continuity lambda, then the original function has a modulus which is bounded again in terms of the modulus of continuity of the realizer, modulus of continuity of the representation, inverse modulus of continuity of the other representation, and some polynomial slack. So this is our polynomial main theorem quantitative strength of the kreitz weierauch main theorem for polynomially admissible representations defined in this uh, subtle sense, which makes sure that every compact metric space has a representation that is polynomial admissibility and also makes sure that this notion of uh, polynomial reducibility, that is a quantitative counterpart to the second condition of kreitz and weierauch actually is transitive. So that's uh, all good and nice. And uh, Dong Xiu Lim and I are pretty proud about this, this uh, theorem. Um, but it's not the end of the story. There's some deficiencies. So let me explain to you why this is uh, not, uh, we're not entirely happy with that. And to explain that, um, uh, <clears throat> observe the following problems, namely, in a sense, this main th theorem is an intentional uh, result, namely it involves modulus of continuity of the representation and inverse modulus of continuity of a representation, which means that if we proceed to a different representation that may also be polynomial admissibility, polynomially admissible, then we get a different theorem. So what we want, what we hope for is an extensional 
main theorem that uh, where all the requirement and properties of the representation are not in the conclusion of the theorem, but are captured by a notion of admissib quantitative admissibility, and therefore only properties of the spaces under consideration uh, occur in the conclusion, uh, not properties of the representation themselves. So that's what we hope for, that will be the topic actually of the third part of this tutorial. Um, and it's going to be actually the entropy of the spaces that enter here. The second deficiency is that is only a polynomial version of the uh, qu quantitative, polynomially quantitative version of the main theorem, not a linear one. So using this a polynomial admissible uh, polynomial main theorem, we can recover co carry course result that the dyadic representation uh, relates between functions have a polynomial models of continuity and realizers uh, having polynomial modulus of continuity, but it does not yield the statement that I already claimed but didn't prove yet uh, about the signed digit representation relating function with linear modulus of continuity to realizers with linear modulus of continuity. So we want to have a strengthening and it's not at all clear how to arrive at such a strengthening even in the definition, right? So we could, for instance, try and actually we did try to strengthen the hypothesis in uh, admissibility by replacing this expression where all the polynomials occur, uh, uh, replacing them with linear function, linear bounds, O of n and O of n here. That seems like a natural way to improve this uh, from polynomial to linear. Uh, this is a definition that we actually were able to, Dong Hyun, to be fair, in his master thesis was able to show that every compact metric space has a representation with this uh, stronger bound than the models of continuity. Here it's linear bound, linear in the entropy, and a constant shift in the uh, argument. But uh, it seems that uh, when requiring this stronger bound than the models of continuity, the second condition in general cannot be uh, satisfied so that uh, uh, with this stronger notion, it, does, it doesn't seem that every compact metric space admits a representation with a stronger condition. So that's, uh, we're kind of stuck here in our attempt to improve polynomial main theorem to linear main theorem. That's one deficiency and another or maybe related one is uh, that there's a this slack between the two bounds. So let's, for instance, suppose we start with the uh, um, um, models of continuity uh, kappa, and then according to item C, obtain a bound on the models of continuity uh, lambda of the realizer. And now we plug that into an item D uh, back in, and thus recover a bound on the modulus of continuity of the original function. Well, we know the modulus of continuity of the original function is kappa, but let's just uh, for fun, for a sanity check, see what the applying this item C and D together uh, says, uh, how much we can recover uh, of our original knowledge of having modulus of continuity cover uh, kappa by combining these two claims. And what we recover is the following bound. So here it is a polynomial slag, then inverse of modulus mu, then comes this mu, then comes the original cover kappa, then polynomial slag, then inverse modulus nu, and then comes the original modulus nu, you see. So as you can see, there's a lot of loss. Uh, we start with modulus kappa, and in the end, after going back and forth, we only recover this much larger bound on the modulus. So there's a kind of some information loss. Uh, and so, of course, our hope is to uh, uh, develop a tighter version of the polynomial main theorem where all this slack is absent. Maybe a linear version, linear uh, 
main theorem. Uh, but uh, using the current notions and approaches, this does not seem feasible, although uh, we haven't uh, really uh, given up. But uh, anyway, so that's uh, going to be the uh, topic of, uh, of the third part. So um, uh, in the third part, we're going to, this is, this is kind of the cliffhanger, we're going to take this condition uh, definition of a continuous reduction from zeta to xi with a continuous re reduction function f and just uh, formally uh, put the xi on the left hand side with an inverse right um, that gives this condition uh, now this condition doesn't seem to make much sense for various reasons first of all as i emphasized the inverse of a representation in general doesn't exist. Representations are usually not injective, so we cannot form an inverse. Or at most, at best, the inverse is going to be a relation set valued. And this is actually what we're going to look at in the third part. We're going to look at uh, multi-valued functions and continuity of such multi-functions. And from this perspective, what we the original requirement now can be expressed. Observe or recall that the translation, the continuous reduction itself, is still required to be a single valued function, namely a selection. This means this is a restriction of that. Um, and uh, this is a set valued, right? F, the continuous reduction should be a selection. And this is uh, what we're going to investigate in the third part. So to Summarize and recap in part two. Uh, we had a recap of part one first. Then we consider this uh, dictionary uh, of translating or back and forth between qualitative and quantitative notions uh, like uh, continuity. Quantitatively means modulus of continuity. We knew that. Scholarization. Compactness corresponds to entropy called Mogorov. Uh, again, scholemizing total boundedness. Uh, we've seen quantitative version that of the well-known fact that the continuous image of a compact set is compact again. This is Florian Steinberg's lemma from his PhD thesis. And in the third part, we're going to see a counterpart to the equilogical spaces that uh, Bauer, Berkedahl, and, uh, uh, and Scott uh, introduced for uh, computability studies for qualitative uh, representations. Namely, we're going to look at compact ultrametric spaces as a, a count quantitative counterpart, but that's part three. Before in part two, we discussed the uh, notion of polynomial admissibility that required us particular care to develop. There was a, a trade-off on the one hand side, we want every compact metric space to have such a representation. On the other hand, we want the uh, reduction, polynomial reduction between such representation that uh, is defining the, the second condition of polynomial admissibility to be transitive. Uh, so that uh, was captured by a relative polynomial reduction relative to the modulus of continuity under consideration with a slag at a very careful uh, position. Uh, then we could prove the polynomial version of the main theorem, uh, which uh, was a great uh, uh, progress, but which still had some deficiencies among them, that it's only polynomial, not linear, uh, main theorem, not linearly admissible uh, representation. So thank you. That's all for part two. And uh, as a cliffhanger to make you curious in part three, after recalling part two, we're going to discuss multi-functions, multi-valued functions or non-extensional functions for the reasons that I have uh, briefly indicated, but we will consider much more extensive motivation in part three. We're going to consider standard notion of continuity for multifunction and see that they are not suitable for all purposes. Instead, we're going to 
introduce or rather adapt the notion that Arnold Pauli and I have developed in 2013. And then we're going to prove a very important uh, result, namely a quantitative continuous selection theorem for multifunctions that satisfy this new quantitative notion of continuity, provided that this of multifunctions uh, between compact ultramatric spaces. This is where the ultramatic uh, condition really comes in as a counterpart to equilogical spaces in qualitative uh, uh, representation theory. Uh, the selection theorem is blatantly wrong and must be for uh, other spaces such as for real numbers. And then based on this quantitative selection theorem, we're able to divide, devise, uh, to define, uh, to prove a linear main theorem, which is still going to be intentional in that it depends on the modulus of continuity of the representations under consider, but only with a linear slack, which allows us to actually finally prove what I already uh, stated and claimed before, namely that the sign digit representation uh, uh, maps uh, functions with linear models of continuity to realize us with linear models of continuity and vice versa. And then finally, we're going to have an extensional, although unfortunately only polynomial, uh, relative polynomial main theorem. That's uh, our plan for part two, three. That's uh, all for now. Thanks for your attention and goodbye.